I want us to be thinking in terms of um, the heart of God toward us. And uh, one of the things that has been going through my mind and my heart for some time is putting together a number of things and meditating. I think one of the lost mandates of God is this unhurried time in the presence of God. Not just talking to God, but listening. And not leaving until God has said all he wants to say. And I've learned, don't ever ask God a question if you're not prepared to stay until he gives you the full answer. It's an affront to God to ask him a question with no intention of staying around until he answers it. And so there's been a, a very deep burden, I believe, created by God. And all of my sharing is going to be, as best I can tell, from God's perspective, not from ours, but from God's perspective. What does he say? How does he look on things? And in the day in which we live, how does God see them? And uh, invariably, if you're in the presence of God and you're waiting on God, there come some things over your heart that only he can bring. I remember that passage. This is my translation of it in Philippians 2 where he says, let the full implication of your salvation work itself into every corner of your life and do it with fear and trembling because it is God who is working within you, causing you to want to do his will and then enabling you to do it. And so without the enabling of the presence of God actively causing you to want to ask questions or want to bring something before God, you would never do it. But when it does come, don't, don't try to tell God how pleased he must be that you're thinking of certain things. He'll say, I caused you to think about those things. There's something on my heart that I want you to deal with. So I'm causing you to desire some things, and I have felt that. But he said, you ought to do it with fear and trembling. And I can tell you that that characterizes the last eight to ten months in my life of uh, asking God some things, observing some things, watching the Holy Spirit bring to my remembrance some things, watching him teach me some things, and bringing it to a point of reference that is very, very, very painful. I have been watching with a great deal of interest and participating myself in millions who say they're praying for revival. I know one individual, a religious leader, who every communication that he puts out, he always adds at the bottom, would you be one of a million people that I'm asking God to join me in praying for revival? I know whole agencies that are seeking to enlist people to sign on the dotted line, I will pray for revival, and they're seeking a million people. I've seen many, many uh, ministries that have arisen to enlist people to pray for revival. And I spent many an hour with Bill Bright, who called on hundreds of thousands of people to fast and pray for revival. And I've talked with him much about that. And entire movements have arisen just to pray for revival. And yet revival tarries. But what grieves me as much as any 
I hardly ever hear any religious leader asking the question, why does revival tarry? It almost at times seems like we become like the prophets of Baal. We cry louder. We cut ourselves. And we feel that the more earnest we are, the more likely God is to hear our cry. But somewhere down the line, there's got to be some very, very significantly placed leaders who are willing to stand in the presence of God and ask him, with all of this praying, why does revival tarry? Why is revival being delayed? Because we have been told by very sincere people that if millions of people beseech the throne of God, he's bound to bring revival. Please know, God is not bound to do anything we do. <laughs> and so there has to be another whole approach and that is, I think we need to spend time in the presence of God and ask him why. And we're not without information about that. The word of God is full of the reasons why God does not respond. In the book of Jeremiah, he comes and radically says, it's too late for Jerusalem. This generation of evangelicals absolutely does not believe that there could ever come a time when God would say to America, it's too late. We don't believe that. And therefore, we behave accordingly. We believe we will always have one more chance. You have to cancel too much of the scripture to say that. And he said, if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me and plead for my people, I would not listen to them. It's too late. The die is cast. And I believe that one of the reasons that Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem in Luke 19, when all those around him were praising, Jesus was weeping. And I believe the reason he was weeping, among others, he'd just come from the Father. And the Father had said, Son, it's too late for Jerusalem. I have passed judgment, and I will not relent, and I will not turn back. Jerusalem will be destroyed. And so he cried out with the broken heart of the Father, if you, even you, had only known in this your day what could have made for peace. But now the enemy is coming upon you. Now, folks, if the Lord Jesus heard the Father say that, and all through the scriptures, others heard God say that. Is anyone standing in the presence of God today to hear if God is saying that about America? Or have we approached God with the, with the sense that will never be said of America? Many have said that with the nature and the extent of the sin of God's people in America today, God would have to apologize to many other cities that he destroyed if he does not deal with us. And so I ask the question, why does revival tarry? I've even heard some people who, when they pray, they almost accuse God. And it goes something like this, Oh God, you made some promises, and you've not kept your promise. And then they throw some scriptures back at God and said, you said that if I did this, you'd do this, and you haven't done it. I've been there when they prayed that way, and I want to fall on my face and say, oh, God, forgive this, dear brother. He doesn't know what he's saying. You never do anything out of character. You never do anything out of timing. You do never do anything without a reason. So I want us to take these moments, and if you will let this be the beginning of a personal relationship to God, where if nobody else asks the question, you will. But you're going to ask it, not in an accusing way, but in a grief-stricken way, with a sense of trembling before Almighty God. Lord, would you 
would you know whether I could handle what you will say next? I believe the reason that often God withholds some of his information, we couldn't take it if he told us. Matter of fact, some of us would go into eternity just like that. We could not take that kind of a laying of the heart of God over our heart. So what I'd like to do is, is help us to at least begin the sincere, earnest, authentic, transparent <coughs> pursuit of God to ask him with all the praying that is being done among God's people, why is revival being delayed? So that we might make some immediate, radical, total adjustments to God. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of scriptures I went through and I'm going through for myself. But the one I want to read is from Jeremiah 2. And I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage, and I may stop along the way, but I think you'll catch the heart of God. In recent years, I've heard many speakers say, if there's something that does not seem to be right to you, please understand the problem is never with God. Amen. I mean, you can just settle that one before you ever start searching. The problem is never God. So you need to go to a passage that speaks from the heart of God. And then you have to ask the question, Oh God, is there anything in this passage which speaks to me? Is there anything that your spirit is taking and translating it into my setting, our nation, the people of God, the covenant people of God in our own day. And I'm going to try and maybe draw some parallels in a moment. But listen carefully as I read a rather lengthy passage, but I think you'll catch the reason why I'm reading the lengthy passage, Jeremiah 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. My problem is I get sidetracked on the first sentence. <laughs> Do you know, with all the incredible moving of God through that modest little work called experiencing God, do you know the number one criticism I get from key religious leaders? Henry has the audacity to tell people that God speaks to them today. Number one criticism. What did this very first sentence say? <laughs> Folks, if I applied that, it would be devastating. The word of the Lord came to me saying, the God of the universe, pleading, pleading, as Hebrews uh, 5, or 2 Corinthians 5 says. But let's, let's go on. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord. You're going to hear something from God's perspective. You're going to hear it as God understands it. I remember you. I'll come back to that. I remember you. The kindness of your youth. The love of your betrothal. When you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord. The first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. How many would be included in all the families? Does that include yours? 
Does that include your whole family or just you? Folks, when he talks this way, you need to make sure that all your family hears a word from the Lord. And you're to take it to every one of them. Some of you may say, I have a rebellious child and they won't hear. It has nothing to do with what you ought to do. Whether they hear or whether they don't, you better take the word from the Lord to all your family. We have 14 grandchildren. The oldest two boys, the first oldest has already preached his first sermon and the second son, uh, grand, oldest grandson last week told his dad, I feel the Lord wants me to be a pastor. Someone said, you don't expect all 14 to respond to you and I said, I do. <laughs> and I will give every ounce of my being to take whatever God says to me and make sure that all 14 of our grandchildren hear a word from the Lord. So he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me? Have followed idols and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, Where is the Lord? who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought, shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land. You made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal. They walked after things that do not profit. Therefore, I will bring charges against you, says the Lord, against your children's children. I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and see. Send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, but my people, my people, have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. One thing God often does when he's bringing an indictment or a charge, he calls all the created universe to be his witness. And he says, all the heavens and all the earth were a witness when I made a covenant. Now I want you to stand and be a witness as I bring a charge against my people. For my people, now who is he talking to? God's people. Folks, he's not talking to Hollywood. He's not talking to the homosexuals. He's not talking to the women's lib or Washington. Who is he talking to? My people. Revival is always what God does with his people. America is a reflection of the condition of God's people. I'm one along with Bill Bright that concluded that 9-11 was God's warning to God's people that he was beginning to remove the hedge of protection from the nation because of the sin of God's people. Not the sin of the nation because the sin of the nation is a reflection that the salt has lost its saltiness and the light no longer dispenses the darkness. God's people are clearly 
responsible for the condition of America. Now, when I say that, I get an indictment in every possible direction. And the only reason why I do is because people don't want to be responsible. It's not our problem. This whole generation says no matter what happens, it's not their problem. That doesn't surprise me. But from God's people, it surprises me because all I do is quote Scripture. And they don't even want Scripture, especially if it's not the Scripture they want to hear. My people have committed two evils. Now, this phrase you're going to see twice more. The heartbeat of this chapter is a simple phrase. My people have forsaken me. You're going to hear it twice more. They have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, the artesian well, and they have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a homebound slave? Why is he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitants. Also the people of Noph and Taphanes have broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourselves? In that you have forsaken the Lord your God. When he led you in the way. And now... Why do you take the road to Egypt? I could give you an aside here. Why do the pastors of mega churches make a trek to Disney World to find out the latest methods of marketing? Why do you go down to Egypt? Why do you go over to Assyria? But you never come before me. God's people are forbidden to go anywhere else except to God. No matter how you justify, we are a generation that believes that the end justifies the use of any means. That is almost blasphemy. The means that God uses must be kingdom means. You cannot do kingdom business with the world's methods. Count on it. You have to do kingdom work with kingdom methods. But there's a whole generation that believes you can use all the methods of the world. If they're successful in their work, why can't we be successful in the kingdom work? Because God won't make you successful using the world's methods. Now, you may get a crowd, but you may not have a church that Jesus built. You can get a crowd. But please do not equate getting a larger gathering with the blessing of God. Amen. The two are not connected. You have to understand the blessing of God from the heart of God and the ways of God. And so he says, Now why do you take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sihar? And why do you take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Now, you notice what he had said before this. I am to you, what? A fountain of living water. I am to you an artesian well. Why do you go anywhere else for water? You ought to be out of your head to do such a thing. But God's people forsook the living water, so they could find water in Egypt and Assyria. And God will say in Isaiah 30 and 31, the first few verses of both those chapters, He'll say, I'm going to make sure that all the help from, that you seek from Egypt and Assyria fails you. Have you ever had anyone say they used a particular program and quotes it didn't work for them? But they never asked God, why did God not choose to cause it to work? 
You didn't go to him. You went to a program that someone else used. And you went to success and not to him, and he shut it down. And the testimony from all across the nation, from many, many, a spiritual leader is, well, we tried that and it didn't work. It never does. He works. It doesn't. So you shift it from the living water to the waters that cannot profit. It says your wickedness will correct you and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God. And the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. Certainly one characteristic of this generation is we have lost the fear of God. Matter of fact, there are those who absolutely try to teach God's people they don't need to fear God anymore. You have to cancel the book of Acts chapter 2 when it says, and the fear of God came over the whole congregation. Do you think it had anything to do with what happened next when they turned the Roman Empire upside down? In that early church, on several occasions, it says the fear of the Lord came over all the people. One of them is when Ananias and Sapphira died. Now all they did was cheat on their income tax. All they did was just tell a little white lie. There is no such thing. And what did God do? He took them. And the scripture says, and the fear of the Lord came over the whole congregation and the whole city. Would to God that such a fear of the Lord would return to the people of God. Now, if you want God to discipline you or if you want revival, if you're praying for revival, you're praying that God will return in all of his fullness to the people of God. Do you want to know what it looks like? Looks like Acts 2 and following. And fear came upon everybody. To be in the presence of the fullness of God is a radical experience. And it is not a pleasant one. Edwin Orr, that wonderful godly man of revival, his very last sermon that he preached at Ridgecrest before he died was revival is like judgment day. That's not how we describe it. If I was to use that first front of the sentence and say, revival is like, many of us would say, praise and thanksgiving and joy and salvation. But he was right. Revival is what God does to his people when he comes in utter, utter judgment on the people of God. Because as goes the people of God, so goes the redemption of the rest of the world. If he can't get our attention, then his whole purpose and plan to redeem a world comes to a halt. Now, where he does get our attention, there's no limit to what God can do next. So, I want to just quickly share with you what I see in this passage and in other passages. But... First of all, God always is asking us to remember. You remember in Revelation 2, when he's talking about the church at Ephesus, probably the most significant part of that repentance, because he did say, did he not, you need to repent and return to your first works. But the most important part of that is remember the height from which you've fallen. If you do not remember the height from which you've fallen, your repentance will always be inadequate. 
you will not repent in such a way that God can bring his mighty presence. And so what does he say to the people of God here in Jeremiah? He says, I remember your first love. Isn't that amazing? That the God of the universe would say, I remember your first love. I remember how you responded when I delivered you out of bondage. And some of the most graphic descriptions of what his people were like when God found them are found in the prophets. And he said, I remember how you responded. It's like, by the way, there's not a way under heaven that I can ever forget my wedding day. You know why? My wife won't let me. <laughs> She's forever describing what it was like for her. And she'll go back to this very day and describe the joy and the excitement and the love she had in her heart and the thrill. And I said, well, you need to know when I was kneeling there at the front, I was scared half to death. She said, why were you afraid? I wasn't afraid. I said, Marilyn, I knew you weren't afraid. You would have stood up and sung a song if, you, if we'd let you. You were the happiest person I'd ever seen. <laughs> I said, well, for one, I said, I, I may be different at this point. But I was realizing that God had taken one of his own children, and for 21 years he had shaped that young lady into a mighty servant of his. And she had a love for mission. She had a love for God and had a love for God's people and a love for music and and I, I sort I had, I'm still finding out things that God did when he put in her life, his grace. But I thought to myself, who in the world could be a steward of a life that God has prepared for 21 years? And I thought to myself, I could make or break this beautiful young woman. And I could squander what God did for 21 years and taking her on summer missions and filling her heart with the world and giving her a heart to pray and a tenderness in her heart like I had not seen because I had never seen someone that God had shaped up close like that. So I was kneeling at the altar trembling and she was having a ball. <laughs> but you know one of the joys of our marriage now coming up 44 years is to remember the first love. And she will say, Henry, I remember my first love. Folks, I don't know about you. I can't betray that love. I don't want to depart from that. And every once in a while, I'll tell my oldest son that I just preached with in Memphis just this last week. I say, son, you have no idea. You can't except for your own son. But when I first held you, my firstborn was nine pounds, six ounces, 22 inches long. He was a whopper. <laughs> and I held that son as a gift of God. And I remember saying, oh God, help me to live before this little one in such a way that he would choose to want to serve the God he saw his dad serve. And I can remember when he came forward and did. And now I preach with him. And God has gifted him as an exhorter. That's all the only term I know. I said, son, I've been with you many times now. I want you to let me go first. And he always protests to say, but you don't always leave me all the time I need. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you know I get excited about the scriptures. But I said, let me tell you why I want you to go second. You have an incredible shaping of God that has helped you to know how to help God's people to respond to the truth. And what a time. Every time he closes the time when both of us have spoken, the altar is absolutely filled down the aisle with sobbing, weeping people of God. But I remember when I held him. And I said, Lord, fill my life 
with my first love for my firstborn. And there's not many days goes by that I don't say, Father, keep the first love for my oldest son in place. Because I don't know all that you still have in mind. What God is saying here is, I remember the first love. I remember it. And he said, I remember you, the kindness of your youth and the love of your betrothal when we went through the wilderness together. And that's why when God brings to remembrance the first love, that first response to him, when in fact he showed us his hands and his side and his feet and how it overwhelmed us. And I don't know about you, I've never gotten over that first love. When I first understood how much he loved me, I don't know about you, I can't betray that first love. I just can't depart from it. I can't. And it is an astonishment to God that he would say, you have forsaken me. Not you've gone after programs, you just have forsaken me. Now, folks, our problem is we get so caught up in activities and we get so caught up in doing things for God, we forget that he's looking for the relationship. You're doing all of this, but you're moving farther and farther from me. You're getting so caught up in activities and administration and you're presenting it all to me for my glory, and none of it gives me glory. I don't take secondhand glory. What you're doing for me is secondhand glory. The firsthand glory is when you let me do what I want through you. Then I get firsthand glory. He doesn't accept secondhand glory. But he says, when you do that, you forsake me, the fountain of living waters. Is it any wonder? why so many of God's people seem to be spiritually thirsty. Folks, a 10-year-old could understand it. If you leave the fountain of living waters, you're going to get thirsty. Someone said to me one time, Henry, do you ever have any dry spells in your walk with God? I could answer that one just like that. I said, never. I can never remember ever having a dry spell. They said, that's amazing. I said, no, it isn't. I said, he told me that inside me is a fountain of living water and out from me will come rivers of living water. How in the world can you have a dry spell with all of that going on? <laughs> I'm serious, folks. If you have a dry spell, you have departed from him. Just admit it. Oh, no, 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 I haven't departed from him. I still love him, but I'm just having a dry spell. Folks, connect the dots. <laughs> he is the fountain of living waters, and if you're having a dry spell, you have departed from him. Now, he keeps saying to us, I remember the first love. And he comes back to say, do you remember? Then second comes this huge statement that I'm still absolutely astounded with. You have forsaken me. You see, it's not activity that we forsake, it's him. And I believe the one thing that causes revival to tarry is our separating from him. And we just turn aside. And I'll list some of those. But the intimacy of the relationship is absolutely crucial for revival. Some have said, and I think Brother Roberts would say, he, he worked for years and years and years on a definition for revival, and he finally brought it down to one word. Revival is God. <coughs> That's right. That's what it is. It is God in all of his fullness. And when God in all his fullness is present, then all that he is and all that he has and all that's on his heart has absolute freedom to be expressed through that solitary life. 
And I'm convinced that if God withholds His manifest activity and presence, it's because He knows we have departed from Him. Now, every time God said that, the children of Israel were at the height of their religious activity and the height of their success, the golden age of Israel. But they had forsaken Him in the midst of all of their religious activity. They no longer sought Him. I was talking at the table last night, and uh, I know many, many wonderful books have been written on the disciplines of the Christian life the disciplines of the devotional life. I have one personal response to that. Love is the discipline. Hear me carefully. If you have to have discipline to love God, you are out of fellowship with Him. Nobody has to tell me how to be disciplined to spend time in God's Word. Love is the discipline. I love Him and I spend time unhurried in His Word. And I read all the books on how to be disciplined in your time in the Scripture. I almost want to say, don't do that because you're going to have people disciplining themselves and they don't realize the problem is they've lost their first love. Therefore, you have to be disciplined. Nobody has to tell me to be disciplined to love my wife. I mean, if she saw me doing that, she'd get after me in a hurry. And you know, I'm not one of those whom she let say, I told you I loved you on our wedding day. Do I have to keep saying it? I mean, she expects it 50 times a day. And she wants the spontaneous love relationship. And folks, you know why I pray? I love him. Love is the discipline for praying. If somehow it becomes a drudgery, I need to go to the root cause. The root cause is not that I'm not disciplined in my prayer life. I'm not disciplined in my prayer life because the root cause is that I have moved from him who is perfect love. And so when I start to see myself moving away from the spontaneous desire for God's Word and prayer and the spontaneous desire for the people of God because He loved the church and laid down His life for them. And if I love Him, I'll love the people of God. We need to get over this criticism of one another. Maybe justified but you don't criticize what God loves. You just say, Lord, would you return me to the first love that you had for me and then let me love your people with that same kind of love. Love itself is the discipline. But he says, you've forsaken me. Now here's the other phrases that he uses. Verse 5, he says, you've gone far from me. Oh, I wish I had time on that one. You're seeing things from God's perspective. Now, don't protest. You haven't gone far from Him. You were in worship last Sunday. Well, I've been in many, many worship times that the whole service was far from Him. It was self-centered to the letter. And everybody gets a clap as if we were giving God praise. You weren't. You were clapping for the woman who just sang. Yes, yes. And if you didn't, she would look aghast. Why didn't you clap? I sang. We have worship that is entertainment. Not only that, but we've departed. We've departed from the message of God. And I think two things have been an abomination to the churches. One, 
is the church growth movement. We forgot Jesus said he would build the church and we've said it's okay, Lord. We've got the best methods in the world and we're already doing it, thank you. He said you're getting a crowd but you're not building a church. And the church remains full of sin but now we're doing the second thing. We're seeker friendly. God deliver us from that. When you're seeker friendly, you'll never preach on hell because it's not seeker friendly. I went around this revival heritage tour last summer and I was listening to the preaching. That is, what kind of preaching was done all over England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland that brought tens of thousands of people on their faces in the rain and the mud crying out to God all night long? And I found something in common. The people who heard the preaching came under an awesome sense of eternity. And they cried out to God, I'm one breath away from eternity. And I'm not certain where I will go. And they would cry out all night long. Pastors wore themselves out going from person to person. 30,000 gathered in Belfast all night long. 500 came through in a commitment to Jesus Christ. But the preaching brought them face to face with eternity. So I came back to our large church in Atlanta area and I began to ask pastors and staff and people, when was the last time you heard a message on hell? Nobody could remember. I'm serious. I could ask you, when was the last time you heard a message on hell? That's not seeker friendly, folk. Not only that, but your deacons will not like that. Now what's happening is we're shaping God into the God we want him to be, and folks, that's evangelical idolatry. When you shape the God you want him to be, who is not the God revealed in the word of God, you are then following idolatry. And so the God we now serve doesn't look anything like the God we see in the scriptures. And so we don't preach repentance to God's people because if you picked up on the problem of divorce, you're going you're to get your chairman of the deacons mad at you because his daughter, he has already approved for divorce. So you don't preach on that even though God says, I hate divorce. And folks, what God hates, we better hate. Now why in the world does revival tarry? Because God's people are full of idolatry. We're shaping God into the God we want him to be. And if there was any kind of a mention of repentance some dear soul will, will pray under her breath, Oh God, I pray that there's some lost soul here that needs to repent. And God is saying, It's you, sister. You need to repent. But you see, God's people are not facing the incredible need for us to repent. We've got to get over our anger and bitterness and brokenness and all that we begin to see happening. In the last month, two significant people, one in Atlanta, very key Christian leader in Atlanta, committed suicide. My heart immediately said, what's happened with us that we come in church and sit together and before the week is out, one of the key people in our church commits suicide and everyone looks around to say, I wonder what happened. I can tell you what happened. They had no encounter with the living God. Week after week they came to church, but they came to a, a God who was shaped to be what the church wanted it to be. So the music's what we want it to be, and everything about it, the instruments are what we want them to be, and it looks, all of it looks just like the world. So they don't encounter the holiness of God and they don't find themselves being brought into the presence of Almighty God. And yet we cry out, O oh Lord, bring revival. 
And he could say, why should I? There's nothing in you that matches what I require to come to my people in great presence. What's happening in your life? You could just look at the whole area of prayer. Would you have to say, God told us to pray without ceasing. You've disobeyed that one right out. And we say, oh, I don't know how to do that. Well, stand in the presence of God and ask Him and ask Him why He told you to. He said, you ought to, Luke 18, you ought to pray and never quit. Now, I could give you one of my other foibles. With all of the benefits, with all the benefits of helping people into a quiet time, there's one that's hurtful. And that is, we, how much of the day can God be with you? How much of the day can He speak to you? Well, then don't leave Him in your quiet time and go off to do your own thing the rest of the day and then call Him in when you need Him. Folks, the quiet time in the morning is simply the pace setter for the rest of the day. But we have told people, have your 15 minutes with God. Folks, that's an abomination to the holiness of God. He is God, and we're not. And he said, you need an unhurried time with me at the beginning of every day. And I found as I work with many people, the greatest time saver for any day is an unhurried time with God in the morning. He'll redirect you all over the place. Well, I'm grateful they allowed me to have two times to speak to you. I'm going to talk about true revival. But folks, do you know why revival tarries? The heart of God is broken that we have forsaken Him. We've run after everything under the sun except Him. We don't pray like He told us to, so we've forsaken Him. We don't trust Him. We trust our money and other things, but we don't trust Him, so we've forsaken Him. And when you forsake the people of God, you've forsaken Him. Because he said, how you respond to the one I send you, you're responding to me. I always treat every child of God that he brings across my life with utter, utter joy and incredible stewardship. Put my arm around an African-American pastor last week. We were in the presence of about 3,000 of his people. And I put my arm around that dear brother, and I said, My brother, you don't, you don't have any idea what's going through my heart. I love you in the Lord. And I see what God's doing in your heart. And I love my Lord, and that's created an incredible bonding. When he got out to introduce me, he said, I stand on the shoulders of Henry Blankaby. He's my spiritual father. And I wept. An African-American calling me his spiritual father. I said, Lord, you love him. And what you love, I love. Don't ever let me depart from you or I'll depart from my brother. I can't do it. I can't do it. Let me pray with you. Father, we read carefully, slowly, as you spoke to your servant, Jeremiah, and our heart was condemned. And something within us cried out, O oh Lord, not me. And your spirit said, yes, you. And I have wept before you to realize some of the things that you said, you saw, that I didn't see are now real to me. And I'm asking you, what do you see in me that causes you to delay revival? God, forgive us if we've departed from the very first love we once knew. How could we? How could we? Return.
Oh, God. And if you'll help us, we will love you once again with our first love. And before this conference is over, may there be such an incredible volume of love to you as all of us go back to the first love, which was the deepest and most profound and the simplest of them all. But may it be transparent and open and honest. Remove from us what is keeping us from that. And if by any chance we have been attracted by the gods of this world, oh God, convict us and we repent of it and return to you and to you alone. And may you be pleased then to do a mighty work through hearts that love you and you alone. And we ask it in your name. Amen.